Yeah, thank you very much for coming on this uh, beautiful day to sit in the shade um, <laughs> outside. And uh, this idea arose because of, um, well, let's say I wrote a manifest around the time that actually a while ago when Julian Assange went into the Ecuadorian embassy and I realized that he was only speaking through the balcony or through the internet. Uh, and then I thought this is kind of the same thing that we are doing now, that the balcony actually becomes a really beautiful analogy for the position and the environment that we're in now. The fact that there's all these phones actually actively recording us, but that we're also aware now, by now that we know that also a phone that is off can also already record you and send your data away. That basically we're never in private anymore as long as we are available to get read by the network and we have the network with us at all times, at least for most people. And um, so this idea that the private environment is not really there anymore, but we're all actually on the balcony, that we're on the balcony all the time, and the, the challenges that there are to reappropriate this, spa this space, to kind of uh, see if this, we can use this environment, this new environment for uh, artistic expression, if we're, how do we use this, do we encrypt art, if we need to encrypt our information, do we start to use encryption in art, do we need uh, specific codes, do, the idea that art can be read by everybody. Do we keep these values? Um, this is something which I'm interested in. Um, and I've tried to write this in this kind of uh, strangely poetic uh, uh, manifest. And now we ended up sitting here on this beautiful day on the balcony since we're still only on the balcony where there's nothing actually changed. We didn't enter the real landscape of the internet yet. We're not back into private mode. We didn't manage to protect our communication yet. There's like, we're still in this position. So um, thank you for coming. And uh, we'll try to uh, improvise some kind of uh, conversation about this topic, I guess. You can, you can hear a few beginning uh, lines of this, of this manifesto. I think it is good for everybody to, to get an idea of the, of the um, intonation, of, uh, of the sound, of you know, the tone of voice. So um, here it comes. Should I, in Slovenian? No, yeah, that, well, that okay, so I can't speak Slovenian. So, Zdaj smo vzi zunaj na bokonu, stijimo na plaskadi, narejeni iz cvita predelanega v korporativni vežijen Yavnega Postora. Excellent. So now that everybody is on the same page, this is from a fantastic catalogue, from an amazing book. Uh, you sh you will an should amazing should exhibition. be able to get it in the museum store. <laughs> anyway, um, did I tell you that when, uh, when, I, when I was with my kid in, um, in London one time for Halloween last year, we went and made a photo in front of the only proper tourist attraction in the city. Oh, you actually went to the balcony. Yeah, you went to the I Ecuadorian. Made a photo in front so, uh, of <laughs> you actually went. You went. Uh, it's called Schadenfreude, no? Oh uh, no! Come no? on. So no, you like no. celebrate that this guy is like uh, stuck inside the embassy. No, and it's just a part of the Herod's experience. You yeah. take your kid to Herod's. You buy strawberries dipped in white chocolate. They cost ten fucking pounds, just six of them in one pack. Mm -hmm. And then with that sense of guilt, you go and see this balcony. The, the Ecuadorian embassy. It's, it's connected. It's one experience <coughs> after Victoria and Albert. And mm -hmm. in Victoria and Albert, I just read, they're going to show. Did you see that? Uh, there's some exhibition. And they're going to show the Guardian laptop. The with one the that broken they, heart they had to destroy with, yeah. the, with these machines. Now, yeah. now they're going to show it in a museum. Yeah. But it's very important that these things, yeah, it's, it was an extreme thing that happened. And it, so this was about the, the hard drives from the Guardian that contained the information leaked by Snowden that was, they were forced to destroy in their basement, which is a kind of ridiculous idea because of course the information was on several places. It wasn't only physical on these hard drives, but then it was quite um, nice, like almost like a, a fairy tale to see them having to destroy with uh, simple tools, having to destroy these hard drives. I was involved in some demonstrations in 1991. This was like 55 years ago or something. And all of a sudden there was this information that uh, the police is going to come and arrest everybody, uh, put everybody to jail. And uh, in all of these political parties, this was in Belgrade, 
uh, in all the political parties, they were destroying the lists of party members uh, because they wanted to protect everybody from massive state repression, you know, Milosevic, you know that name? Uh, and uh, in one party, the two guys that were supposed to do this uh, destruction of the list of members, they had like they thought they have like five minutes to do it, and the mm -hmm. only thing that they knew how to do was to break the monitor of the computer, because <laughs> it was it was showing there, mm -hmm. and uh, you know they were safe <laughs> because the situation was serious. So they started to panic, and you know they needed to do something now. Okay, so what is in this question, I think, or what's in, what lies in this, is the this appreciation that we have, or that at least I think I can share with you, and maybe the people here as well, for these kind of strange artifacts of this kind of misappropriate or like misunderstandings of the digital realm, let's say, or like this, like that you would think it's endearing that they would just destroy the monitor, but then also that there's this historic significance to this. It would be historically significant to save that as like not even like the political change but also this kind of barrier how we understand this kind of digital realm right like yes but you know all these museums of holocaust and the second world war or, or american civil war they all contain one copy of a bible with a bullet in it yeah this is similar to that there's like many copies of that same book mm -hmm. uh, but the ones with a bullet inside or a hole tell a bigger story mm -hmm. that's one aspect that's that's one appeal right and the other is a misappropriation misappropriation because genuinely for any technology i think it works uh it's much sexier if it's if it's used in a wrong way mm -hmm. and uh, a position of an artist should also always be to never accept the consumer trap and to always try and uh, try to use the machine for another purpose or try to try to avoid using it for the right purpose at least but there's also the question in this in in which that you want to go back to the object that has aura if you would go to walter, walter benjamin the he's idea dead. of yes is that but uh, this idea this necessity to have you know you would have this kind of uh, you would have the you would have all this information but the broken monitor has the aura has the object so for example I went to visit uh, Bill Atkinson um, a few months ago and Bill Atkinson is the person that implemented the first undo mm -hmm. uh, so he uh, structurally implemented the fact that we can use uh, Apple Z or control Z and he thought of this, but he thought of many things. He thought of the drop-down menu. He made the selection line, the fact that if you select something in uh, an image editing software, that that's, this moves, this dotted line, um, and also undo. I was very happy to uh, meet him. Um, the fact is that he came up with a f early device, like an early phone, like an early networked small phone. And he came up with that just after he left Apple, because he was the 11th employee of Apple. And uh, he left there and then he came up with this and it didn't quite work. There weren't like enough uh, carriers like uh, whatever, like all these cell phone carriers uh, that wanted to support the system. And later Apple came out eight years ago with the iPhone and he saw the advertisements. He didn't work with Apple anymore. So he's not rich. He invented all these beautiful things, but he's not he didn't uh, get rich off of it anyway. But uh, this iPhone came out and he saw the advertisement in a magazine and what he did is that he cut out a piece of wood exactly in the shape of an iPhone and he took the picture from the magazine pasted it on the piece of wood and he carried it around in his pocket for six weeks just to feel what it would be like to have so much power and so much agency in you in your pocket on your body and he still had that piece of wood and then I thought it was so remarkable that a guy like that that makes these thinking steps of being able to implement undo to be able to implement the drop he actually made the first Mac paint which is like mm. the, the thi big thing that he did that he uh, made the first commercial drawing software um, he made uh, a hypercard which was one of the first hyper softwares which was a precursor of the web browser all these guys, the guy's 62 and sits there and he still has this piece of wood of the iPhone and all the potential that he would wear around in his pocket. This necessity to relate to this object just as much as that we have this necessity to relate to a certain space, that we have the word cyberspace, uh, information superhighway, chat rooms, all these ideas of like an actual space in which we could be. That I feel like we are all on a balcony, we're on this metaphysical balcony and now we are actually on a balcony just to help us think about the process that we're in. I almost feel like the balcony is like this piece of wood that he had in his pocket. It's called intellectual crutch, right? That's the expression. Yeah, but it's also this strange aura, no? Like it's also still that you need this aura of this specific point. Like now we have the aura of this 
this balcony here in Ljubljana that we had this meeting on. All right. Uh, I don't know. I, I remember having this idea, this this wish to to do a project. I met few people that invented things, and I wanted to talk to them about. Oppenheimer and about Turing and about all these people that were from a generation before these mm -hmm. guys. Uh, 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 you know, Tom Jennings, maybe the Fidonet guy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. he's cool and uh, spent some time talking of these things. And nobody is Oppenheimer, even, even Oppenheimer was not Oppenheimer. Uh, the awareness of these people that come up with good ideas that turn into products mm -hmm. or turn into mass use, I don't know, media technologies. These, these guys. These guys don't have a clue, you know. They are working out of uh, out of some motivation that is purely engineering, like a, a feat that they need to perform, or like competition inside a company or something stupid like that. Some of them want to change the world for the better, and they end up ruining it for everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's kind of a messy thing, I, and I believe it is fine to go back to the sources of things. But uh, it, this this guy here, the the non-inventor of the mobile phone, mm -hmm. that sounds very cool. Uh, that sounds very cool because that's a piece of a very sad piece of wood in yeah. his pocket. Yeah, because well, it's maybe an aspiration it's that he, but also the fact that he realized that there was this potential to this network device that he kind of he understood that that would be such an important value. I mean, I keep thinking about my my dad dying in 1994, and um, or now almost 21 years ago. And then I think if I would, sometimes people would ask me, so what would you do if you would meet him again or something? Mm -hmm especially other people whose fathers died or parents died or something and then uh, I always like um, I always think like I can't even ex start to explain what situation we're in now can't even start to explain like how we're traveling how much we're looking how much we're sharing how much we're engaging with information how much we're how much agency we have walking through our lives and the fact that he had this piece of wood to start to almost physically relate to that situation mm -hmm. is, is remarkable to me yeah, he explained things to himself through that piece of wood, you yeah. think. Uh, how are people reacting to your balcony text about us being in the middle stage where we don't quite understand the technology that we have brought upon us and uh, mm -hmm. where we need to act and we don't know how to as a society, as a bunch? Is anybody raising any eyebrows? Is anybody reacting at all? Um, well, are you asking me to quantify my own, uh, to give my user, to ask for user experience I yes. could do that to give my manifest and like give a user experience just like that, together with the manifest and say, is this manifest? Uh, What's the average Was it fast enough? Was it like uh, yeah. comfortable enough? Well, I mean, I don't. I so in that sense, I don't know how to quantify it. There's been an interesting exhibition made in Amsterdam on the base of it. Uh, some people have responded to it. Some people have uh, written different versions of it. Uh, there's even an, a balkanism algorithm that will rewrite it indefinitely long texts based on uh, the manifest that's um, scary man algorithms are fucking scary and um, um, yeah I don't know like there's a I mean I'm uh, seriously to be completely honest I'm really happy that we can uh, uh, that I can write this text and I can have this idea and then we can talk about it that's a kind of compliment no? okay and that happens. It does well, happen. Now. This. Oh, you mean this? Mm hmm So it does happen, yeah. But this thing I wanted to ask you last night, we spoke of, of, of you know, net art, of, you know, older years, you know, from mm -hmm. 20 years ago, and, and how is it maybe in these last 10 years, and uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm unable to make big comparisons, but uh, did, uh, did my attempt to describe it uh, help in any way? Did, yeah, did, did, did I think so. I mean, I think it was what it helped me to understand is that there's you know the the fact is that there's um art made dealing with these kind of with, with let's say dealing with the internet or if it be it on the internet and that through time it's always been uh very much defined by personal relationships by friends working together by certain dynamics and by um and especially like how how certain collaborations were very exciting and how certain ones uh, were less exciting. Were totally unexciting. Yeah. Complete bullshit. Yeah. Utter crap. Yeah, well, well I'm trying to figure out whether, you know, it's, it's just a blip in time, like some, some uh, weird people uh, stumbling upon some fresh opportunity or technology. And 
having a nice time about it before everybody understand it's a career booster and then mm. moving on to there and uh, all of a sudden there is no community anymore this this dynamics was a sad thing to happen and uh, it's uh, irreversible uh, nobody can pretend to be uh, just open frank and friendly uh, anymore uh, once they cross this this line I, I found that to be disturbing 20 years ago and I'm noticing it is happening even today with the uh, kids doing this post what's it called post internet business are you into that do you call yourself that no but I don't know anyone else that really actively calls themselves a post internet no. artist but um, I mean I am interested in the conversation that it's, uh, that people are having about it especially like how um, how a cultural phenomenon and I'm, I mean personally I think that we're at war that I think there's an information war going on out there and that there's a, a cultural revolution spinning out of this and it's uh, it's international it's global uh, except uh, in like uh, North Korea um, and Cuba. large parts of Africa and Cuba and uh, large parts of the rest of the world anyway so kind of international it's happening but anyway we're in this cultural revolution and I think that this is um, um, interesting how people have different uh, approaches to uh, translate this I towards an audience and I think post internet translates it specifically towards a kind of standard art world uh, audience and what I think was interesting is that the, the web at least and let's call it the web but or the internet um, offered the possibility to find audiences outside of this art world audience outside of this hierarchical system of galleries, curators, institutions, and you could find people to show, like you could show art to people that weren't in touch with this, weren't going, and weren't thinking this is a better gallery, so that's a better artist, and this is more va has more value, this uh, work is more expensive, and this that's why it's more important. And I think it was interesting that people could find an audience in a different way, and I think post internet specifically finds an audience within a quite structured. Uh, uh, art world audio, yeah. Uh, use many words, but we call this selling out. You know, uh, it's it's a simple way to put it. You know. Mm. Uh, anyway. Uh, well, I did completely disagree, but I mean, I think it's more important to realize that you're how active you're in how you're dealing with your audience, and the fact is that there's the biggest challenge at, at hand is to deal in this conversation with also a large audience that you can have this. You can escape this standardized hierarchical system. You can also challenge that system. I think it's interesting now that there's within this post-internet that there's still a wave of feminism with, with inside of this where people are trying to uh, challenge the certain systems where, that it's a male-dominated art world. Um, I mean, I think in that sense, sense, there's still a lot of activity out there to, um, to challenge the system. I think it's just boring to keep it only within the art world audience. Um, but the fact is that this is just some people opt to only work for that audience. I think there's a bigger, bigger challenges for multiple audiences. But um, yeah. the difference I'm noticing is that you see, uh, uh, in the 90s uh, there was this uh, automatic habit of uh, defining yourself as a, as a person oriented against the, you know, art system we were born into. Mm -hmm. That was uh, the one completely uh, ever present fil rouge among among everybody. That was the main topic, and uh, one of the key things worthy exploring was this. You know, remember this phrase, "disempower the middleman." Like you would have this direct contact with the person receiving your shit, and then uh, by the virtue of having this direct contact, you would automatically have the finally the proper st uh, strong position to avoid the art bureaucracy, mm -hmm. or to or to negotiate on your own terms. You know, not not just to fight. With the gatekeepers to get into some, you know, room, a hotel room. Um, you know, I, th I found that at the time to be normal. So when that started changing, uh, it was a surprise. It was uh, like an unwelcome. But don't direction. you think? Don't you think that happened also that it became normal for people, for a lot of people, that there were. Um, okay, so th the simple analogy for me is always when I left art school. There were people buying really expensive cameras on really expensive tripods because they wanted to have broadcast quality video. Mm. And broadcast quality video was the most important because then you could be on TV or film festivals would accept your work. 
and it would have to have a certain very expensive professional standard. For me, the nice thing was that I didn't need to have all of that to find an audience for my work. I could also create my work in a different way. But a lot of people that started uh, with their professional practice in a later point of view already was it was logical that you would have a blog you would have a tumblr you would find a whatever like a, an audience through facebook or instagram whatever you could maybe have my niece i talked to my niece she had thirteen thousand followers on on tumblr and then i asked like okay so what's what's your username and she said like i won't tell you my username that's a secret oh. and it's my own little safe safe playground where i can and she's 13 and then i thought shit she figured it out already she knows that she will have like her own audience and she doesn't have to share that with her family, with people around her. And she has her own little oh, kind of cool. identity she can project on that audience. And I think that the, the, the interesting thing there is that there's, uh, if people are starting their practice and they have this audience already, they maybe start to look towards more hierarchical systems with more official recognition, which is more in the art world. And they start to find this recognition within the art world because after a while, for me also, when I met the, I met this website called the Revolving Internet, and then there's millions of people seeing that, and the pleasure of millions of people seeing that for me was enormous. But there's a lot of people that after a while get used to this feeling, and then want to see that related into cash and exhibitions and art fairs and this kind of bullshit. So it's an antechamber where you still get to evolve, and then you choose. You make your own choices about you whether you want to participate or not. Okay. Well, I guess it's fair enough. Uh, it's quite nuanced. I like it. Uh, since you were, let's say, a very... Uh, 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 no, I don't want to use the word pioneer, but more like a, an active... Um, what do you call Columbus? Mm, a curious motherfucker. Yeah, so if you were, like, uh, since you were a curious motherfucker yeah. for a while on the web, how do you think, how did it influence uh, your understanding of the web now? The knowing that there's a, it turned into such a corporate space with so much... Oh, it's easy. At the time, internet was a space of freedom. We were making it a mm -hmm. better space of freedom. Now, it's just a space of corporate and government surveillance. So you go and den denounce yourself and sell your personal data in ex or exchange it for some perceived convenience or prestige that are of very short mm -hmm. value. Period. Uh, in that sense, it stopped being interesting uh, per se as, as a provider of, of challenges. Uh, challenges are of entirely different aroma now, just like the, the stuff you, you're describing in your, in your text here. Um, so now it's either more about you know, a resolute um, resistance, which has the same acronym as Rolls-Royce, which is or uh, Rafa uh, Rosendahl. For instance, there's uh, millions of places we can go from this mm -hmm. crossroads. But to stick to the main narrative, uh, you either choose to be, you know, uh, a big whistleblower that uh, gives his friends Oscars and Pulitzer Prizes, mm -hmm. or you choose to be Ted Kaczynski, or you the decide, Unabomber? Uh, yeah, the, yeah, the Luna Bomber. My daughter is Luna, I call her Luna Bomber. I, I, I still have to make this t-shirt for her for like, since she was born, I want to do it. Um, or you decide it's kind of cool, you can live with this, you know, in this marinade of, uh, of being completely out in the open with every move you make, with every decision, your shopping decision, or anything mm -hmm. you do online or offline, being recorded in these beautiful profiles and you know sent to the drones above to shoot you. But just you don't you don't feel that there's like a, an idea that within that environment you could reclaim that as um, as a space as a vent, as a performative space in which you can. Uh, circumvent where you can uh, uh, resist certain things you can actively well, perform against certain things you can find vulnerabilities within it and like perform and like give people hope to actually you know like still make make this environment although it's so aggressive and so I don't want to polluted be too cynical but it, it, all you can do is keep trying but mm -hmm. if we're going to be taught yes you know, if, if you want to be serious about it mm -hmm. that's where I'm trying to look right now if you want to change things not just express your disagreement in a good way that will give mm -hmm. people some hope 
about or decorate their walls after mm -hmm. they give money to your gallerist and he gives half to you. Mm -hmm. um, if you're honest to God, you know, want to uh, disagree and then change some rea some part of that reality, it's a tough nut to crack, really. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough one. Mm -hmm. So the way I try to deal with that is I, I work with politics, I work with corporate sector, and I try to filter and to smuggle my own, you know, thoughts or values, make them behave slightly off character. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes... You know, and the off character, does the off character then make it them. art? Well... Uh, or like uh, satisfy your, like, uh, n the kind of ur urge to make art? It's just lets me live in peace with these idiots I'm compelled to work, I have, I have to work with, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, but that's it, that's a maximum I can achieve. You, um. can, you can do it in two or three ways. Uh, you can you, you can resist and, and play with it and do do funky things for your own enjoyment. You can do it uh, in order to uh, have fun with more people and uh, maybe show it in a gallery again. And the third way to deal with it is to is the thing you th the thing you said last night to implicate other people to to. Mm -hmm. to uh, persuade many, as many po as possible, you know, other people to do the same subversive act against such mm -hmm. uh, beautiful customer surveys in shape of, of Facebook likes or in shape of forms like this one. Well, look, um, it, stays, it stays a character treat, you know, it, it's, it's the, uh, the, the thing is that you do not enter this type of art practice uh, and then look around and you find out oh i need to be subversive now so mm. yeah subversive now or oh i need to be sharp about things i see and i need to react fast and uh, you know be witty um because everybody's doing it no you do it because you are like that mm. and uh and when you stop boxing and you go out of the ring you're, you're still boxing with your shadow a little bit all the time you know? uh, it stays with you as as, as part of your character and and that's good because i, I live much much better with myself for sure, mm -hmm. but uh, what I'm, you know, trying to trying to illustrate here is how there's a big, thick, you know, fat wall that's very tall between, you know, symbolic activities where you are either on your own or involve other people in an art world, but that stays symbolic and decorative, and on the other hand, some actual life-changing, world-changing practices, you know, that are properly meaningful. You know? And the only way to penetrate, you know, those microbes that can actually travel through glass and they would need like five weeks to pass through this uh, wall of this glass. Uh, there are some shortcuts, some wormholes. Uh, sometimes you do this art project that's like massively reverberant or what's the word. There must be an even more complicated word, I'm sure, mm -hmm. to explain, to, to, to describe it. It's, it's beautiful to look for that, but uh, nobody can do it deliberately very much so. And I see very many people trying, but I think it's, you know, it should just happen. If I may mystify a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I think this is, for me, for example, it's quite important to see, we can read the news and we can read articles about all the facts and we can see that there's a SIM card uh, company in Holland uh, hacked and there's like all millions of SIM cards are all hacked already. It's a great story. Uh, and we can read that story, but what about the poetic interpretation of it? What do we do with it? How do we community laugh about it and then realize, like, oh shit, it's actually really fucked up. How do we share these emotions? How do we view this? And I think that's why these artworks are necessary, you know, yeah, to also deal with this. Not only to change things, but also to collectively deal with things. I'm not so much against any of, of this Guernica uh, 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 approach here. It's, it's just that I'm making a division between symbolic action and actual action. It's mm -hmm. one thing is like the thing itself and the other is describing the thing. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, now with this war approaching, we all have to get used to violence. We now all, again, you know, like our great grandfathers have to, have to go through all that process of uh, accepting that uh, this is the way antagonisms and conflicts are solved. And, mm -hmm. and and, and this is the angle from which I'm observing this, you know, uh, this whole uh, dilemma of f putting stuff in galleries. You know, or, uh, but in uh, small individual action that uh, somehow infects other people or, or influences other people into seeing that resistance is fertile. You know? 
That is, that is sweet. That is a way to go. That is totally above zero. That is good news. But by itself, it doesn't influence the actual external reality. That's what, that at some point, this whole big avalanche of inspiration, of poetic practices, needs to get translated into action.